My topic today is public finance and what is the purpose of public finance? To get money for the government to finance its services. My take on this is that we don't really need public finance. It's a fallacy to think so. We should privatize all government services and then we wouldn't need public finance. And I have here in my notes that I should now end the lecture at this point. <laughs> since I've now proven we don't need public finance. But then my next note is that Lou isn't going to pay me if I stop now, so I'd better make up something. Speaking of privatizing government services, there was this bridge in Minneapolis that just fell apart and yeah. some half dozen people died. Part of me wants to say I don't really mind this because bridges have to fall given human imperfection. I really shouldn't say that because, you know, it's a personal tragedy. A half dozen people died. If I knew any of them, it, I'd feel it more. Now I can sort of be above it and philosophical and say, well, you know, you can't make an omelet without cracking eggs. You know, people are going to die given that the human race is imperfect and we can't make perfect bridges. But what really ticks me off about this is not so much that people died, people will die. There'll be industrial accidents even under free enterprise. What really ticks me off is that the people responsible for this, instead of going bankrupt, will get more money. What they're going to say is, well, the bridge fell apart, the Highway Commission needs more money to make bridges twice as strong as they are. Whereas if this is a private bridge, if a private company had that bridge, nobody would ever trust them again. It'd be like sort of thalidomide, the, the thalidomide company. Anyone trust the thalidomide company? No. Whereas the FDA that approved the thalidomide is still in business. So this, I think, is a very, how shall I say, dramatic case to prove or support what I just said, that what we should do is privatize everything, in which case we wouldn't need any public finance because there'd be no public. It'd be private. Private enterprise will minimize this sort of a thing, not bring it down to zero. There'll still be road deaths, there'll still be bridges falling, there'll still be thalidomide cases, but it'll be minimized because we'll have this automatic system that will reduce it because people who make errors will tend to lose money and tend to go bankrupt, whereas right now the very opposite is the case. Uh, I'm from New Orleans. We've been victimized by FEMA. They have this bumper sticker, FEMA happens. Um, now they've just discovered that the FEMA trailers are formaldehyde or something and they're making people sick and, you know, this just means we have to give FEMA more money. Not that FEMA goes broke. Okay, but given that I have to say something about public finance, my previous comments notwithstanding to the contrary, <clears throat> let me start in <coughs> by saying that the the typical public finance course in a university is outlined in this way. There it is. <clears throat> what they do is they take a whole bunch of taxes, sales tax, income tax, value added tax, excise, you know, they've got long, long lists of taxes. And then we have regressive, proportional, and progressive taxes. And this is pretty much the outline of every public finance course I've ever heard of at a university. Usually what they'll do is they'll go across. They'll say, okay, let's take the sales tax. What does it look like if it's regressive? What does it look like if it's proportional? What does it look like if it's progressive? And then they'll take the next tax. Every once in a while you'll get a public finance course that says, okay, let's take all regressive taxes down the columns and then the, the next third of the course, let's look at every tax, comparing them, assuming they're proportional and then progressive. And that's roughly what public finance consists of. Maybe the first day what they'll do is talk about what I just talked about, namely that we have to have um, government to, to do all these things and this is how we finance it by getting revenues. Let me, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to give you a long list of taxes and compare them in terms of progressivity. Let me just mention one other thing that is commonly done in public finance courses, and this is the Laffer curve. What they do is they say, 
Well, if the tax rate is zero, how much revenue will the government collect? And the answer is zero. And if the tax rate is 100 percent, namely they, whenever you, you know, whatever your income is, they say, okay, send it in. Again, the tax revenues will be zero because why should anyone work if the government will take it all? And then what they say is, as the tax rates rise, uh, 1, 2, 5 percent, there'll be more and more revenue. And as it gets closer to 98, 99 percent, there'll be less and less revenue, and you get this, um, what's called the Laffer curve. And you'll see that the optimal, uh, no, I shouldn't say optimal, I should say the maximum revenue. <laughs> see how, uh, how this stuff has got into my bloodstream? <laughs> I'm, I have to correct myself because, you know, as, as I have some neoclassical root, roots in me, so I somehow think that it's optimal when the government maximizes its take, you know, which is ludicrous. The uh, point at which the government will maximize its revenues here might be, say, 50% tax rate, say. But the point is that this is not optimal from our point of view. It might be optimal from their point of view, but not ours. And then there's lots of debates. Well, are we past this point? Are we in the 70 and 75? Or are we below this point? And, and a lot of the economists are always having debates as to what should we reduce taxes in order to raise government revenues, or should we raise tax rates in order to increase government revenues? And libertarians and Austrians, although there is a difference between the two, are very much not involved in this debate because we're not trying to maximize their revenues. Okay, so what is the justification for government services and public finance and hence the need for a tax? Typically in a public finance textbook, the first chapter will be devoted to that. And it's, it's sort of gone over very quickly as if everyone understands this and we don't really debate this. The main reasons for this is a thing called market failure. The reason the mainstream economists think that we need government revenues and taxes is because the markets fail. And when the markets fail, uh, government has to step in. Governments never fail, <laughs> only markets fail. Although the public choice school, to give them credit, uh, and I will be criticizing them later in, in a seminar with Tom DiLorenzo, uh, they have made done yeoman work in showing that governments too fail, and therefore the question is not whether markets fail or governments fail, but which one fails more or more seriously. And uh, in my view, there are no market failures. Yes, there are human imperfections, but there's no such thing as a market failure. Now, the usual big three in market failures are monopoly, externalities, and public goods. Today, I will be discussing the two market failures that are most connected with public finance, and that would be externalities and public goods. So first, I will do public goods. What's going on in the public goods analysis is two concepts. One is excludability and the other is rivalrousness. Let me try to explain each of these. The uh, question of excludability means can you exclude people from the benefits of the services who don't pay? The idea is that if you can't, then it can't be done on a private basis, right? So let's say I want to open up a movie theater. Can I exclude non-payers? Sure, I, I set up a uh, booth and you have to go through the booth. If people try to get around the booth, I call the cops and the cops stop them and everyone knows that uh, the cops are there at my beck and call so they don't uh, go around. I used to um, work at Rutgers University and I would travel by motorcycle from New York City and every once in a while I'd pass a stretch of road where a whole bunch of trucks those uh, 18 uh, wheel rigs were stopped on the side of the road and on the top of the cab or maybe on top of the, um, the what do you call it, the, the, the tractor trailer part, there'd be the driver and he'd be sitting there and he'd be looking like that and there'd be a whole bunch of them. And I said, whoa, what's going on here? And what it was, was they were showing pornographic movies on an outdoor screen <laughs> and if you were in a big truck, you, you could stand on top of it and look down. And it's true you couldn't hear what was going on, but I, I think the idea was you didn't really need to hear as much as see what was going on. 
And this was in the 70s, so it was sort of the early days of pornographic movies. I mean, they've always had them, but never in outdoor theaters. And so this is a big deal. The point is that there they couldn't exclude them. You, you get the idea? They couldn't exclude non-payers. Well, they could have. All they had to do was build bigger fences. Sometimes around Ebbets Field or Yankee Stadium, there are apartment houses that are very high and people get out on the roofs and can look down into the baseball fields. So what I mean by excludability is not excluding people from the services, but rather excluding non-payers from the services. And the typical way is to build a high fence so that people can't see, or build an enclosed stadium, a dome stadium, so that people can't get the benefit without paying. Because if you can get the benefit without paying, it, it's hard to see how markets can work. And this is one of the challenges that the um, internet and people who offer services on the internet face. And the way they solve that is by having advertising, right? Okay, so that's what excludability means. And the, the question is, can you exclude? And if you can exclude, it can be private. So yes, excludability means it can be private like pizza. Can you exclude people from having pizza who don't pay for it? Sure you can. Can you exclude people from a crowded street? The answer that the neoclassical economists give, which I'll come to doubt in a couple of minutes, is no, you can't. Imagine a big crowded street uh, in New York City, Fifth Avenue and, uh, I don't know, 42nd Street. Pe you know, masses of people are walking around. C just think of the idea of asking each of them to put a penny in a turnstile or something. It would be just so awkward and it would be so difficult that what they say is you can't exclude. So, if you can't exclude, then it could be private. If you can't exclude, then it has to be governmental. Again, I'm just giving you the neoclassical vision of this. I'm trying to, how shall I say it, make it come alive for you, make you understand it. So I have to sort of uh, bend over backwards to be not critical at this point. I will criticize it in a couple of minutes, but first I want to present it to you in the way that most adherents of it would present it to you so that you can get the, the sense of it. And there is some coherence. There's a certain low cunning to this. It's not totally crazy. Otherwise, it could hardly be the mainstream. There are criticisms that the Austrians will give of it, but before I criticize it, I want to make you understand it. So I have to be sympathetic to it. Okay, the next one is, should you exclude? And here the question uh, comes in, it's called rivalrousness. And the idea is that uh, if something is, um, if, if people are rivalrous with regard to the thing, then we should, uh, we should exclude. For example, if I eat the pizza, can you have the same pizza? No. If I wear this shirt, can you wear the same shirt at the same time? No. So uh, we, are rival, we are rivalrous with regard to this particular slice of pizza or this shirt right now. And since we're rivalrous with regard to it, we should exclude people. And again, it could be a private thing. Now take television. Um, I now send out my favorite TV show to you, which is South Park. And um, who's in the first row? Martin tunes it in, and he's watching. And now Benjamin is thinking of tuning it in. Are Benjamin and Martin rivals with regard to this? Does it mean that if Martin is already watching and Benjamin turns it on, then Martin will now lose it? As, as uh, Martin would lose it if Benjamin started eating his pizza or grabbing his shirt off of his back and wearing it? No. Benjamin can watch it too without any rivalrousness with Martin. Namely, the costs of adding an additional person are zero. So even though we can exclude, and we can exclude by putting in, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, that's the reason I put it in the yes column. How can we exclude people from watching TV? By uh, jamming, the, by sending out the broadcast signals, then jamming them, and then selling people an unjamming device. And when they unjam it, uh, 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 we can exclude them 
from, not get, from getting the show by making them pay for the unjamming device. Pay TV kind of a thing. So in the case of TV, you can exclude, but you shouldn't because they're non-rival. Get it? Okay, so the crowded street, um, you should exclude because it is rival. Here, you can, but you shouldn't. And now you get the case of what they call the pure public good, which is a case where uh, it's a public good on both these criteria, namely the excludability and the rivalrousness. How does this work? The examples I give here are uh, uh, National Defense and uh, the Lighthouse. The idea here is, can you exclude people from enjoying the Lighthouse? No, you can't. Because if I set up a lighthouse to warn ships that they shouldn't come near the, the shore where I've got the lighthouse, anyone can see it, right? So ships who pay me will benefit, and ships who don't pay me will benefit. And why should the ships who... Uh, uh, so, so the point is that I cannot exclude. Can I exclude? No. I can't exclude non-paying ships because once I put the light for, for my clients who paid me, the other guys will free ride. They will also benefit without um, paying for it. So I can't exclude them. So that's one reason for making lighthouses public. Uh, are they rival? No. Uh, ship A paid me and ship B didn't pay me. Uh, does ship A's looking at the lighthouse reduce the ability of the lighthouse to help ship B? No. So uh, not only can I not exclude them, but they're not rival. So I now have two reasons for making them public goods. Okay, everyone with me on this so far? Rivalness and excludability. These are the twin pillars of the market failure of public goods. Okay. Don't think that the mainstream divides these into quarters and says that three quarters of all goods and services should be public goods and only one quarter should be a private good, the pizza and, and the shirt. This might apply to the most left wing of economists who might look at it that way and say that three quarters of everything should be public. But most economists uh, all economists except the Austrians would pretty much agree with what I've now said. But most of them, especially the right-wing uh, part of the mainstream, would say, no, 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 there are very few examples. The fence and the lighthouse and maybe one or two others pretty much exhaust that. And, and there aren't too many examples here. So they might say, uh, this is 90% and we should uh, privatize 90% and only 10% are like that. Let me give you one more example to solidify what I mean by excludability and rivalrousness. And here, what I do is I take uh, crowded highways and crowded streets, on the one hand, and empty highways and empty streets. So I'm just using streets so that maybe it's better, some people will get it more, who couldn't get it when I was talking about uh, pizza and, and lighthouses and all sorts of different things and streets and here it's just streets and highways. For people in out there in radio land who can't see this, uh, what I have is a two by two matrix. I have at the top whether you can exclude and I say yes or no and then on the uh, column I have rivalrousness which means should you exclude and again I have yes and no. And the two yeses here would be a crowded highway. Can you exclude people from a crowded highway? Yes, by having toll booths since there are very few entrances to a highway. It's a limited access highway. Can you exclude? Yes. Uh, should you exclude? Yes, because they are rivalrous. Because if it's crowded highway and one more person, Benjamin, enters and Martin is going along, now it becomes more crowded and they all have to slow down. So they are rivalrous. On the other hand, if you have a crowded street, it's very hard to exclude, or you can only exclude at the infinitely high prices. It is rivalrous, but it's a public good because uh, while um, uh, the excludability, you say no, on the rivalrousness, you say yes. And either one is sufficient to make you into a public good. 
Over here, the empty highway. Uh, can you exclude? Yes, you can always exclude on highways, limited access highways. Should you exclude? No. Because if it's an empty highway, think of a highway at 3 in the morning where every quarter of a mile there's another car and now a new car enters. Does he slow anyone else down? No. So even though you could exclude, you shouldn't. Whereas the empty street uh, is a public good from both of these reasons. It's an empty street because you can't exclude because it's very difficult to collect money from uh, people who are walking on the sidewalk. Should you know because they don't slow anyone down. Okay, let me now turn to a criticism of this, and I'll put this one back up to um, keep some examples in, in front of your mind. The criticisms that I have mainly are a reductios ad absurdum. What I want to, one vein of my criticism is to say, no, 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 it's not true that you'll have 90% here. You're going to have everything governmental because everything is a problem with excludability and rivalrousness. But before I get to that, first let me talk a little bit about the lighthouse. Um, my buddy Bill Barnett and I have a, uh, an article out attacking Ronald Coase, uh, who is supposedly a free enterprise Chicago economist, but we attack him on his lighthouse uh, theory. The idea that we're trying to say here is that you really can exclude. All you do is you send out a message to everyone saying, look, whenever we see ships from the uh, clients and the non-clients, we're going to keep the lighthouse on. And we can sort of discern, not every time, because sometimes it's foggy and we can't tell which ships are where, but other times when the fog is light, we can sort of, with our binoculars or with our good vision, we can sort of see the, the cut of the jib of various ships. And we send out this warning. We say, one of these days, we're going to get you. One of these days, the only people out there on ships are going to be non-payers. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to turn down the light. Uh, we're going to turn it off. It's a credible threat. We're not going to do it every day. Yes, there'll be free riders most of the days. But every once in a while, you guys are on your, on your own. And everyone in the seaport knows this. And what do you think it's going to happen to uh, the ship owners that refuse to pay our lighthouse fees, will they have to pay more or less to get sailors to work for them? Obviously, they're going to have to, they're going to, have to pay more. They're going to pay hazard pay in addition to ordinary shipping dangers. The, now there's one extra danger that one of these days we're going to shut the light off. So now we have a credible threat. They're going to pay more every day, and one day they might lose their whole ship. So we have some sort of uh, excludability ability there. Um, okay, it's non-rival, but at least we get rid of the excludability. Now let's take national defense. Can we exclude non-payers from getting national defense? Well, yeah, sure we can. Not perfectly, but we can make credible threats. We can say, okay, uh, what's your name over there? Warren. You don't mind if I call you Warren? Good, we're all friends, we're all on a first name basis. Warren is a dirty rat. He refused, <laughs> he refu I don't know if we'll still be friends after I get through with you, but he refuses to pay defense services. So what I do is I tell Saddam Hussein or whoever the Hitler of the day is, and it keeps changing, I say, Warren, we're not protecting Warren. <laughs> hint, hint. You know, if you go attack Warren, we're not going to stop you. Well, it's sort of a credible threat. Uh, we, we give lapel pins out, like the, the Mises uh, uh, identification things, and all of our clients have these on their lapel. If he, if he makes a fake one, then he's guilty of fraud or theft of services, and we put him in jail for that. So he has to walk around naked, so to speak, without the little device on his house, on his car, on his person. And all of you bad guys know that if you attack Warren, we're going to come after you, whereas if you attack Benjamin or Morton, they're good payers and we'll, we'll protect them. Will this work totally and perfectly? No, but there's some excludability. Uh, we might say, well, look, you know, the people in the People's Republic of Cambridge don't pay, whereas the people in Texas do. And we're going to defend Texas, but, you know, uh, you want to come into Taxachusetts and bomb them? The hell with them. You know, we won't protect them. And if there's one guy there, then we have to protect them. But then you can get local people. In other words, you can't bomb Massachusetts because there's one payer. 
but uh, you can get everyone else, so you just can't bomb, but you can come in there with tanks and, you know, get everyone. So even on defense and lighthouses, there is some excludability. Now take rivalrousness. Every place where there are empty seats is a place where there's non-rivalrousness. Take a hotel with an occupancy rate of 90%, which is pretty good. I mean, 90% is a pretty high occupancy rate. So I come to the hotel and I say, hey, give me a room. And they say, sure, it'll be 100 tonight. And I say, wait, wait, ta ta ta. You're being incompatible with um, public choice, or rather with, um, with mainstream economic theory. There's room 302, and it's empty. The only cost will be uh, you'll have to wash the linen, so I'll, you know, I'll pay you five bucks for it. But the room is empty. Let me in there, because the marginal cost of um, uh, adding me to the, uh, to the mix costs you virtually nothing, so let me in there. Well, if I can do that with a hotel with an empty room, I can do that with a theater with empty seats. Right here, there's only about half the seats are full. So why can't somebody sit right in front of Benjamin, a short person who won't uh, uh, stop his view of me or something like that? The person could come in and say, well, let me in. I cost you nothing. I'll sit here. I'll be quiet. And um, if it, I'm non-rival. So the idea here is that... Um, this rivalrousness would stop an awful lot because you very rarely have 100% capacity of anything, right? So anything that ever has less than 100% capacity has to be nationalized, right? And anything where you can have any sort of excludability also. And then again, uh, with the, regard to this excludability, just because the government can't exclude, the government can't exclude its way out of a paper bag. But private people can exclude. Private, if I owned um, 42nd Street or 5th Avenue, I would go the lapel route again. I would say, okay, everyone who wants to ever walk on these, uh, on these streets, uh, pay me 10 bucks for the year and I'll give you a little lapel. And anyone caught on that street without the lapel, uh, you know, will cut their nose off or something like that. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I can exclude. Uh, in Disney World and in Disneyland and in Six Flags, they have a lot of pedestrians walking around. Can they exclude? Yeah. You put a fence around it. Or you put a lapel. In other words, just because the government can't exclude doesn't mean private enterprise with an incentive to exclude in order to make it viable can't. So I have to um, reject this uh, uh, kind of a thing. Uh, let, let me give you the, the case of pizza. I was once in the airport and I um, wanted to go buy a pizza. and I, I, Pizza Hut or one of those. And they were about to throw out a whole bunch of them because they have this rule that after 15 minutes, the pizza is no more vi not viable. You know, as far as I was concerned, you know, the difference between a 14-minute old pizza and a 16-minute old pizza isn't that much. And you know, it would have been free. And I, I said to the guy, well, you know, give me one if you're going to throw them out. He wouldn't. But the point is that even uh, pizza, once it's cooked, or a hamburger, once it's cooked and it's older than 10 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever their criterion is, well, uh, maybe they should give it away for free. The point is that once you've cooked it, uh, you know, I might even not only do it for free, but it's a negative cost. Namely, they have to pay the cost of uh, getting rid of it, whereas I'll take that cost off their hands. So even pizza. Namely, there's nothing left. If you use a reductio ad absurdum against this, everything has to be done by government. This would be embarrassing to most economists who believe that they're free enterprises. And yes, there's market failure, but it's only a little bit, and, and the government only has to take over a little bit of stuff, but you know, not everything. OK, that's about it for public goods. Let me now talk about externalities, which is another market failure, which gives rise to yet a whole other set of government interventions which require public finance, namely taxes. And I'm going to try to say that there are problems here also. So what's going on? There are two kinds of externalities. Positive externalities, <clears throat> which are sometimes called external economies. And negative externalities, which are called uh, external diseconomies. First, let's take the positive ones, thought on a positive note, positive externalities. 
for people out there in radio land or electronic land, all I have is a supply and demand curve. And then I have a shifted supply a demand curve to the right, which I call D prime. And on my uh, x-axis, I have quantity. And on my y-axis, I have price. So what's going on here is we start off with an ordinary supply and demand curve. And um, the ordinary supply and demand curve meet at point, um, point A. And A stands for the actual quantity that will occur, assuming we're in equilibrium. We're never in equilibrium, which is an Austrian insight. But for rough uh, purposes, let's assume we're there. OK, so that's the actual amount of stuff that is being produced. However, if there are external economies, that means that there are spillover benefits uh, that you give to other people. For example, um, I take a shower once a month, whether I need it or not. And by doing, I perform an external economy on you. Namely, I benefit you because I, you know, here's my supply and demand for soap. And, and the demand curve is just my private benefits, that I'm clean. But now I give you benefits that I can't charge you for. See, the key is I can't charge you for, but yet I'm benefiting you. Or take the, the case of the pornographic movie. That was an external benefit for the, pe the truck drivers who were watching it uh, from the side of the road. So what they're saying is that whenever there are external benefits, the invisible hand won't work. Remember the invisible hand of Adam Smith, the idea that led by a selfish interest will do that which is in the, the good of everyone the entire society. Well, yes, I will buy this much soap, but only to please myself. But I should really be buying a little extra soap to, to please you, but I don't give a rat. Uh, I don't care about you people. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't buy enough soap, or I don't do enough benefits externally. If I were really public spirited, uh, went over and above my selfish demands for whatever it is, I would be having this, and I put OPT for optimal. Namely, the optimal amount is to the right of the actual amount. And what the government has to do is subsidize. Let me give you another example other than SOAP. Uh, take education. What I will do is get in as much education as will benefit me. But when I become educated, or whenever anyone becomes educated, they become a better citizen. They, are, they can vote more rationally. Say. This is the argument. I think it's all nonsense. But again, I want to give a positive twist to it so you understand where the neoclassicals are coming from. What I want to do is uh, be educated just for myself. But in so doing, I throw off benefits to everyone else. I'm a better voter. I'm less likely to engage in crime. I'll be a more interesting citizen. So there will be all sorts of benefits. So if I only consulted myself, this is the actual amount of education I would get. I wouldn't get the optimal amount of education. And therefore, what the government should do is subsidize soap. It should subsidize education. It should subsidize symphony orchestras. It should subsidize libraries, museums, all sorts of stuff like that, where, where you become a better person in some way. And a lot of the benefits it, uh, accrue to you, but some of the benefits spill over to other people in this external economy sense. So if led by the invisible hand or selfishness, you, we, would not engage in enough um, uh, investment in these things, and therefore the government has to make it right, that's the argument. Well, <laughs> there are problems here. First of all, th these things are subjective. You know, uh, if I'm more educated, uh, l let me ask you, where do they have rent control? In which cities do they have rent control? And the answer is in the People's Republic of Cambridge. Well, they used to. They just got rid of it. The People's Republic of Santa Monica. The People's Republic of um, New York. Uh, what's the one in California? Berkeley. Uh, the People's Republic of Ann Arbor. Now, what do all these People's Republics have in common? Ann Arbor and, and uh, uh, Berkeley and, and Cambridge and all? Intellectuals. Precise. I gave him five bucks to say that. So, <laughs> intellectuals, and, and not just intellectuals, but uh, but uh, educated ones. <laughs> um, uh, universities. There are masses of universities in Ann Arbor. There are zillions of students who all go out and vote, and they all vote for rent control, and they all vote for the minimum wage, and they all vote for you know getting rid of free trade. 
Namely, I can make the case that what we ought to do is tax education, because education <laughs> perverts the mind. <laughs> what, what they teach you there is socialism and feminism and uh, blackism or black studies or whatever it is, which is just a <laughs> black form of socialism. Uh, uh, na namely, they, they pervert you. So, uh, you know, one man's meat is another man's poison, right? The, we bring in some Austrian subjectivism. See, what this makes it, it makes it so objective. Let me give you another example. What I'm thinking of doing is uh, building a park. I want to build Central Park or some sort of park, and I want to build a park that big. The, the big box or the big rectangle is the park that I'm going to build. But if I build a nice park and I knock down a whole bunch of slums or whatever it is I do, I go to the Bronx and I knock down uh, half a square mile, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to benefit these houses near the park. You get the idea? I'm going to increase the real estate values of all the surrounding areas around my park. Namely, I'll only be able to capture some of the benefits of the park, but the rest of the benefits will spill over into all the houses surrounding the park. Namely, there'll be external economies or benefits that I can't exclude people from getting. Therefore, say the, uh, the, the mainstream economists, the government has to build parks because not enough parks will be built if parks are left to private enterprise. Well, again, this is just one more example of the external economies, sort of public goods. The two are not totally distinct, but they are somewhat distinguishable. Again, the point is that if I'm going to build a park, only I know where the park is, right? And what I do is I, if I'm going to build the park here, I start buying up all the houses around there, or at least buying up options to buy. So if I get enough people, do I have to get 100% of the people? No. If I get 40, 50, 60, 70% of the houses around the park, uh, I'll get maybe enough benefits. Now, you know, it's not going to work perfectly, but I will be able to build a public park. So we don't need uh, the government to help us out with um, external economies. Here's a magnificent quote from Murray Rothbard. A and B often benefit, it is held, if they can force C into doing something. Any argument proclaiming the right and goodness of, say, three neighbors who, for, who yearn to form a string quartet, forcing a fourth neighbor at bayonet point to learn to play the viola, is hardly deserving of sober comment. Isn't that a magnificent way of putting this? Three guys, there's a two violins and a cello, and they need a viola player. And uh, they, they have this external benefit if the viola player or this guy, their neighbor, will learn how to play the viola. So according to this argument, what they should do is force him at bayonet point to learn how to play the viola. Or... Uh, get some sort of taxes to subsidize other people to play violas in the general case. But Murray Rothbard, as per usual, puts this in a very um, clear, uh, clear, sharp focus. Okay, now let's talk about negative externalities. Here are negative externalities, and for people out there in the radio land, what I have again is a supply and demand curve, only now I have a shifted supply curve, S prime, uh, either up or to the left of my uh, regular supply curve. And again, what we have is the actual point at point A where we have the ordinary supply and demand curve, and that's how much uh, stuff we'll be producing. However, now instead of, a negative, uh, instead of external benefits, there are now external costs imposed. For example, I uh, create this pen. I'm now in the pen man manufacturing business. And uh, I have to pay a lot of different costs in order to make the pen. I have to buy this felt tip. I have to buy the blue that um, paints this. I have to buy a little metal thing. I have to um, uh, have the ink in there. I have to have a factory. I have to pay laborers. I have to pay raw materials. I have to pay insurance. I have to pay rent or I have to buy the, the land on which the building is. There are all sorts of payments that I have to make. However, this one payment that I don't have to make. And that is, uh, when I create this stuff, out from my chimney comes uh, smoke and smog and all sorts of pollution particles. Uh, 
that go on to other people's lungs and other people's laundry that's hanging outside. Nowadays we have uh, washing machines and automatic dryers, but in the old days you'd hang stuff out on your line, and if you did, if you were near me, your, your, lawn, your laundry would go out there clean and wet and would come back dry and dirty, dirty with my crap that I pour out into the atmosphere. Namely, pollution is the quintessential uh, example of an external diseconomy. The idea is that the supply curve is based on costs, but it only incorporates most of the costs, but there are extra costs that I don't have to take into account when I decide how many pens to make. And therefore, we have to show a, another supply curve or another marginal cost curve for those of you who are into this uh, sort of microeconomics. I have to show another supply curve a little higher that takes into account the full costs. And there's a certain coherence here again. We don't want people uh, building stuff that uh, the actual amount when uh, the costs of doing it are greater than the benefits of it. We want to, if this is the real supply curve, we ought to be stopping here at the optimal, not going producing as much as the actual. So we have various schemes to push us from the actual to the optimal. The, um, what's his name, Pagu, guy named Pagu says we should uh, tax it. And a guy named Kos, I have a whole lecture on Kos um, one of these days, I'll, I'll give that, I'm not going to go into that now. Kos says, well, we don't really have to tax it, we can uh, do it through the, the law courts. Um, but they both agree that in cases of external diseconomies or negative externalities, the market is uh, inefficient or we have market failure and the government has to step in somehow uh, to fix it and uh, the government needs revenues in order to do this. They need to hire a lot of economists, hint, hint. You, <laughs> you can see why this is popular in certain circles. This reminds me of, uh, of a joke. I was once uh, giving a lecture to a bunch of antitrust lawyers and uh, uh, antitrust economists and I told them uh, two jokes. Uh, the, the first joke was, there were three um, people in the Soviet gulag and uh, as natural prisoners discuss, well, why are you in jail, why are you in jail? And one of them said, well, I was in jail because uh, I came to work late and I cheated the st they accused me of cheating the state out of my labor services. The other one said, I came to work early and they accused me of brown nosing. And the third guy said, I came to work every day exactly on time and they accused me of owning a Western wristwatch. <laughs> and, and I got a big chuckle out of the, uh, the assembled uh, antitrust lawyers and, and uh, economists. And then I told another joke. I said there were three prisoners in the U.S. who were in jail for antitrust crimes. And one guy said, well, I was in jail because I charged higher prices than everyone else, and they accused me of profiteering. And the other guy said, I charged lower prices than everyone else, and they accused me of cutthroat competition and predatory pricing. The third guy said, I, I charge the same prices as everyone else, which is hard to see how he could have given these other guys, but forget about that. And they accused me of collusion. <laughs> Dead silence. <laughs> they, they didn't like that one bit because, because their whole bread and butter is based on this stuff. Well, similarly, you can see why antitrust law is very popular among lawyers and, and economists, and you can see why this sort of nonsense is very popular among economists because they have to go and work for Washington DC bureaucrats and I mean you know if we got rid of the Fed uh, how many PhD economists would be out without a job if we got rid of the antitrust division how many people if we got rid of market failure I mean market failure is our bread and butter our I'm, I'm an Austrian so it's not for me but but for them even for me I mean I benefit because the, there's a greater demand for economists okay back to back to this stuff now, the way Murray Rothbard handles this and his magnificent article, something to do with air pollution, if you want to read this article, which is the, the best article that's ever been written on environmental economics, read this article. Uh, I forget what, the word air pollution is in there. Law, property, rights, and air pollution. Say it again. Law, property, rights, and air pollution. Law, property, rights, and air pollution. Thank you, Martin. Uh, uh, look it on the Mises Web. Uh, you'll find it. It's a magnificent article. What Murray says is that this whole thing is nonsense. 
This is not a market failure. This is a government failure. The government says it has a monopoly over the law, and the government allows people to um, pollute. Uh, what Murray says, I'll give you a short two-minute version of this. I go from 9 to 10, so i got 15 more minutes, right? Okay. What Murray says is that in the 1830s, things were pretty good in, in, in this regard. Uh, we had a nuisance cases, which we would now consider environmental cases, where some farmer would go to the court and say, hey, that there railroad, it's, it's setting off sparks, and look what it's doing to my haystacks, you know, 300 feet away. Or some little old lady would come into court and say, hey, that, uh, that block who's producing these pens is polluting me, and look at my laundry, it's dirty now. And, pr and what they, uh, the plaintiffs wanted was uh, damages and then an injunction. Damages means pay me for the damages you've already done. An injunction means the court orders them to cut it out. And if they don't cut it out, they go to jail. You know, pretty serious stuff. And uh, this had all sorts of beneficial effects. People would be led as if by the invisible hand to use clean burning but more expensive anthracite coal rather than dirty burning but cheaper sulfur coal. Because if they use the sulfur coal, they, they'd get all sorts of plaintiffs coming after them. Uh, there was even environmental forensics. You know, the reason we have forensics on those sh cop shows is to figure out... The reason we have forensics uh, is because we have laws against murder and rape. So we want to know who, who raped. So we have to look at the semen, we have to look at hair follicles, stuff under your fingernails, blood spatter, stuff like that. Well, environmental forensics is, here's a piece of the dust. Where did it come from? Let's go get them and put them in jail or, or get an injunction against them. And so you had a, a, a very early kind of in, uh, environmental forensics. And uh, naturally, the, the, the entire economy was led into a non-pollution intensive mode of operation. Then what happened is during the progressive period, 1880s, 1890s, um, we wanted to be number one. You know, in many college campuses, you know, where number one means, you know, we whop the other guys in football or basketball or something. Well, who was number one then? The UK. We wanted to be number one. So the next time some stupid farmer or little old lady came whining and sniveling about their uh, pollution, the, uh, the court said, yeah, yeah, the, they violated your property rights. You're stinking, lousy, sniveling, selfish private property rights. We have a much more important thing to worry about, and that's drum roll here. Uh, the public good. And what does the public good consist of? The U.S. being number one. And uh, we're not going to get that way by uh, uh, tying one arm of manufacturing behind their back and letting them worry about the likes of you. So the hell with you. Well, they tossed them a little sop. Uh, they had minimum smokestack height regulations. <laughs> so instead of a smokestack uh, being 20 foot high, and now you can tell where the stuff is coming from, they made it 300 feet high, and now it goes all over, and, and it's very hard to figure out where anything came from. And it wasn't until the 60s or the 70s, that uh, 1960s, that people started realizing, you know, we have to walk around with the uh, smoke protectors on our face, or what do you call it, gas masks? And then they had the Clean Air Act and stuff, but the, the way to go according to Rothbard, is sue them. Now you might say, well, you know, if uh, 10 million cars are polluting, you can't sue each car owner because each one does an infinitesimally small amount of this negative externality stuff. But Murray's answer to that is, well, we'd privatize roads and you wouldn't sue each car owner, you'd sue the road owner who is creating a, a lot of pollution, and then the road owner would turn around and say, okay, you guys, you, you don't want to use a catalytic converter, you don't want to use clean burning fuel, fine. We're going to just charge you a quintuple. So you get one or two cars like that, and everyone else uh, will be led as if by an invisible hand to do that which is right. The point is, Adam Smith's invisible hand only works when the law is the way it should be. The law sort of undergirds economics. And if the law is wrong, then you get market failure. But it's not market failure. It's rather government failure to uphold the law, the, the libertarian law of private property rights. Okay, one last point that I want to make, and then I'll uh, open for questions, is uh, some people say, well, uh, we still have to have public finance because taxes are really like dues. 
you know, if you join the golf club, you have to pay dues. If you join the, the tennis club, you have to pay dues. If you join the country club or the condo association, you have to pay dues. Well, you're now in this club called the United States of America Club, and uh, taxes are just dues. So don't, you know, okay, you don't want to call it public finance and taxes, call it dues. But you have to pay dues so that we can have a clubhouse. Well, the obvious answer to that is, you know, when I uh, join the, the chess club or the bridge club or any club uh, and, and we make rules for the club, it, it's pretty clear when I do it. I must have missed the meeting where they started the United States Club. And namely, there was no meeting, there was no agreement, it, it's not a club. It's a very different kind of an operation. So I end as I began with the claim that um, uh, we don't really need public finance. The undergirding of public finance is market failure. Market failure is predicated on public goods and, and externalities, whether of the positive or the negative sort. Uh, the profession uses market failure as a stick with which to beat up on the free enterprise system. It's all unjustified. Okay, so now we can have a few minutes for discussion, questions, objections. Yeah, and uh, you wrote, you know, the whole you know, environmental discussion and the uh, suggestion to, to um, um, create uh, light for pollution and to have them available. What, what do you think about that? Uh, the, uh, the, there's a sign here, please repeat audience questions before answering. Uh, he says, in Europe and elsewhere, certainly in the United States, they have this thing called tradable emissions rights where you uh, have a right to pollute, but you can only pollute so much. What do I think of that? Well, again, there's a certain coherence to this. If you want to reduce pollution, and what you get is this sort of hockey stick kind of a thing. Uh, here is the quantity of pollution, and here is some sort of indication of price or value or something like that. And you get some sort of hockey stick, hockey stick idea that as you start adding pollution, uh, the atmosphere is able to take care of it because the atmosphere can absorb an awful lot. So you keep polluting, you keep polluting, and then all of a sudden, now additional amounts of pollution are very, very harmful. So what you really want to do is have this amount of pollution. And this isn't too bad because, look, even under free enterprise, under the law of de minimis, you would still have some pollution. I mean, when we can sue each other under the 1830s regime that Rothbard was talking about. I mean, look, we all breathe out, don't we? Carbon dioxide. I mean, you know, we can't stop that. And we all breathe out from the other end, too. I suppose I shouldn't mention that. But cows, we can blame cows on that. So there will always be some pollution. I mean, if you can have any manufacturing, there's got to be some pollution. Uh, but you can't be suing people for breathing out because they've homesteaded that kind of a thing. And if you uh, have very clean burning anthracite coal and research and development in how to stop pollution, and your smokestacks have all sorts of, um, what do you call it, things to grab the pollution before they get out. I'm sorry? Scrubbers. Scrubbers, thanks. I need all the help I can get. Uh, and the amount of pollution that comes out is only uh, distinguishable in parts per billion. Well, okay, so we're not too far apart there. Uh, again, we're not um, hippies here, or as Ayn Rand would uh, call libertarians, hippies of the right. <laughs> we're, not, we're not hippies here. We're not saying we shouldn't have any, uh, any industrialization. You have to have some. And the courts have to decide you know, what's reasonable. You know, uh, there's a thing called coming to the nuisance. If you move to Pittsburgh and uh, you really need a, uh, an oxygen tent, <laughs> you can't start suing them because they were there first and had some sort of uh, homesteading rights on sending stuff out into the air. But, you know, you want to stop it there. Now, the coherence is, if you have, say, uh, two different uh, companies, let's say right now you have uh, 150 tons of pollution, and uh, the optimal amount we decide is 100. To just come up with numbers. I'm not prepared on this. I'm just giving you uh, numbers as an example. And let's suppose that right now, each of three companies are doing 50, 50, and 50, okay? And what you want them all to do is to reduce it to 33, 33, and 33, or 33 and a third. Again, this is reasonable. However, this guy, it would be very, very expensive for him to reduce it at all, whereas this guy it would be very cheap to reduce it. 
So what you do is you tell this guy, well, you know, I'm not going to reduce it at all, but you reduce it double, right? And I'll pay you to do that. So we'd still get, we'd move from 150 to 100, but we would do it in a much cheaper way because if we demanded that this guy do it, it would cost an arm and a leg and, you know, he can't do it. So you have tradable emissions rights. There's a certain coherence to it. The problem with it, and here um, <clears throat> there's a quote I use in my writings on this um, by um, Morton Anderson. He says that tradable emissions rights are like tradable rape rights or tradable murder rights and just as unconscionable. He says that if you take um, garbage and dump it on someone's lawn, we know that that's trespass. Whereas if you take garbage and incinerate it and send it over to someone's lawn in the form of little smoke particles, all of a sudden it's pollution, it's not a trespass. This is a trespass. We shouldn't be having markets in trespass. Right? What you should do is say, you know, cut it out or cut it out to levels that, that would be reasonable. And the way to go about this is to not have tradable emissions rights, which is very much like market socialism. In, in my own publications on this, what I do is I compare it with the Tito-Yugoslavia model of market socialism. And I accuse Milton Friedman and, <clears throat> and other people who advocate this sort of a thing as being market socialists. And this is the same sort of a thing as, uh, what's that in education? Educational vouchers, where you buy and sell rights to steal other people's money to educate. This is not free enterprise. This is Chicago economics or, you know, uh, uh, semi, demi, free enterprise. Uh, it, it's very, and you have the same thing in uh, FISH, ITQs where instead of being able to own fish, like you own cows, you now have a right to catch fish, but nobody owns the fish. So these are all sorts of compromises that I, as a libertarian or as an Austrian, uh, would have great problems with. Yes, Warren. Uh, would you just comment on the difficulty of our society uh, coming to grips with your ideas in two areas, specifically, let's say, elementary school, Well, let me not talk about health care too much because I have a whole lecture on that, I think, on Friday or Saturday. So I'll duck out of that and maybe treat it then and talk about schooling or in general. Why is it so hard to sell libertarianism or free enterprise? <clears throat> My own <clears throat> theory on this uh, has to do with sociobiology. Sociobiology is the theory that the reason we are the way we are now, and I'll have a lot more to say about this when I talk about um, racial and sexual discrimination in one of my future lectures, I think also on Friday or Saturday. Uh, sociobiology is the theory that the reason we are the way we are now depends upon what it took to be successful and leave progeny 100,000 years ago or a million years ago when we were in the trees or in the caves or wherever we were. For example, we are hardwired to like babies smiling and to hate babies uh, not smiling. Because if there were two societies in the old days, uh, one that liked babies smiling and hated babies frowning and the other didn't care, guess which one is going to leave children? <laughs> this one, and we're uh, the children of these people, whereas these people died out. So if you have the wrong sort of makeup, you don't survive, and if you don't survive, you're not us because we've survived. Well, in those days, we lived in caves or in trees or in groups of 20 or 30 people or 100 people tops. Nowadays, we live in groups of 6 billion or 300 million or whatever. Now, there are two ways that we can cooperate with each other, and we have to cooperate with each other if we're going to survive. One way we can cooperate with each other is explicitly. We know each other. I scratch your back, you scratch my back. I was sick, you gave me food yesterday. Today you're sick, I give you food. Tribes that do that sort of a thing survive and prosper and leave progeny. Ones that are not at all filled with the milk of human kindness and are not able to cooperate with each other, it's sort of the way we're accused of being because we favor free enterprise, they don't survive. Because if you have 20 or 30 people, none of whom helps the other, the prognostication for that group is not high. So we're hardwired to cooperate explicitly. 
But we're not hardwired to, to cooperate implicitly. And the only way you can cooperate with uh, 300 million people <laughs> is through markets, implicitly. Uh, you know, these Hollywood uh, stars, they have a, a party and they invite 10,000 of their best friends. You can't have 10,000 best friends. We're not capable of having 10,000 best friends because we didn't have 10,000 best friends a million years ago. We're not hardwired to, to even know 10,000 different names and faces. And yet, if we're going to have an economy of the modern sort, we have to have prices and markets and, and profits. When Katrina came to New Orleans, some manufacturers or some retailers jacked up their prices of candles and, and flashlights and milk and water, and they were roundly condemned for being non-cooperative, and the governor of uh, Louisiana said, we're going to throw these vermin in jail. What those people were doing was having implicit cooperation. Because if the prices rise, then more of those supplies will come in, and you'll ration them was if you keep the prices low, everyone's going to grab, the first five people online are going to grab it all. You see? And yet, the governor could say this, because she, uh, Governor Blanco, a woman, because she was sure that she would be supported by the Louisianans, and she was, because we're not constitutionally equipped to appreciate implicit cooperation of the sort through profits. We see this as, as horrible. You're taking advantage of people in dire circumstances. Have you no, uh, you know, fellow feeling for your fellow human creatures? So that's my explanation of why, not just in schooling or healthcare, but in everything. It's sort of like, you know, pushing up the rock of Sisyphus. It keeps coming down. Why we have, why we get one or two percent of the, the vote, except for Ron Paul, which is a, uh, an entirely new and wonderful and unique experience. But the reason he's now polling so low, or the reason libertarians are doing so poorly, or the reason that the, the Mises Institute isn't uh, 300 times bigger than it is, is because we're just not wired to appreciate free enterprise, as we are wired to appreciate uh, the March of Dimes or you know charity or something like that. So if you're a good guy, you'll give charity. And you won't take advantage of people by raising prices. I'm out of time. Thanks for your attention.